everyone, my name is Austin Roos. I am president of the Center for Family and Human Rights, otherwise known as CFAM. We are a UN accredited uh, non-governmental organization. Uh, we have been active in uh, UN causes uh, since the, gosh, since the Cairo conference in 1994. And we opened our doors formally in 1997. I am here to, uh, to chair the meeting uh, over the next couple of hours uh, for an incredibly important annual conference on the family. Uh, that is uh, that is uh, hosted uh, by a, 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 a group of UN member states who uh, fight very hard uh, for the family, often uh, against uh, great odds. Um, and uh, so I say welcome to the, the conference protection of the family and family oriented policies in the time of COVID-19. Uh, um, our sponsors for today's uh, uh, conference are first and foremost, the group of friends of the family, uh, 25 UN member states who, I, like I said, have, have banded together to fight for a proper understanding of the family uh, over against those who may want to um, redefine it um, and, uh, and, and other things. This is a group that, that believes that the family is uh, divinely uh, created and therefore we are called upon uh, to protect it in, in law and policy. Also, we are, uh, uh, we are co-hosted, well, most especially in the group of Friends of the Family, we wanna thank our friends from Belarus, who are really the driving force between, uh, 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 behind the group of Friends of the Family and this conference. So, so thank you, Belarus. And you'll be hearing from the ambassador here in just a minute. Also involved in the planning and execution of this, of course, is my organization, CFAM. Uh, also, uh, our friends at Family Watch International, uh, uh, and uh, additionally, uh, two uh, important coalitions of family organizations that work at the international level, Civil Society for the Family, and also uh, the UN Family Rights Caucus. Uh, we are going to uh, begin here in, in one moment uh, with a video produced by our friends at uh, Family Watch International. But I just wanna say one word about how remarkable it has been to watch this small coalition of pro-family states banding together now for 25 years to protect the family from redefinition and much else. You know, I, one of the good things about Facebook, you know, I like Facebook. One of the good things about Facebook is this little thing that they have called memories. And today uh, in memories popped up two previous events that this coalition has put on. One from uh, May 17th, 2019, where I'm proud to say that my daughter and her school colleagues uh, played the harp, uh, the harp circle from Oak Crest School in Northern Virginia played. Some of you will remember, will remember that. And then I look back to May 17, 2016, um, in which there uh, was a, a, a photo exhibit on the family that this group organized. And it was a, a photographic uh, exhibit that was put on in the lobby of the United Nations when uh, you know, the United Nations was a little bit more open than it is now, sadly, because of, uh, of COVID. Uh, so this group has been together for a very long time doing incredibly important work. Um, and today's conference is, is a, both a celebration of that and also an examination of uh, the important issues related to the family at the UN. So uh, we will begin uh, with uh, a, a video of, produced by our friends uh, at Family Watch International. Uh, it is called Voices for the Family at the UN. So I am who I am today because of my mother, because of uh, the, the confidence and trust I saw in my mom. Family is a backbone for uh, any humankind. I believe in families. Families are the cradle of hope. They nurture the future and children need parents. With them, we can face a better world. The most wonderful thing that could ever happen to me. Family is the most essential unit in a society. It's an honor to speak of family as a mother of five sons and two daughters that have truly added to the quality of life for me and my husband. This is my granddaughter. 
when when she is beside me i feel that i own the whole world and when i hear her voice from far i feel happy and children thrive within a family far better than in any other structure. These uh, relationships make us strong. We can uh, survive everything. We enjoy life much more. The family is so important. If it wasn't for my mom and dad, I would not be here. I see family as the central organizing principle of my life for my wife and I our children, encouraging them, equipping them. Children are our future, they're our greatest asset, and the family is the place where children are nurtured and raised. The world needs families in order to create life, and this creativity goes on throughout all generations. Family matters. We should uh, really all stand together uh, in protecting it. Family is the best. So let's support our families. Thank you to uh, Sharon Slater and her team at Family Watch International for uh, that lovely video. It was nice to see so many old friends that we've worked with over these many years uh, standing up for the family. Um, we are going to enter now into um, uh, some remarks, statements from UN uh, member states and observer states. And before we do, I, I want to uh, let uh, any member states um, here who are present and have not uh, entered the queue that all you need to do to enter the queue is to let me know through chat um, and, uh, and we, will, uh, we will bring you uh, into uh, the conversation. Um, we are going to, we've got several statements from UN, uh, from UN member states. Um, and we're going to start with um, our old friend, Ambassador Valentin Ribikov, uh, the permanent representative of Belarus to the United Nations. He and his team have been remarkable in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the developing this organization, putting on this conference every year and standing up for the family. And also I would say for the unborn um, in, uh, in UN negotiations these many, many years. So it is, uh, it is a great honor for me to, uh, to introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Ribikov. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Austin. Thank you for your kind words uh, about Belarus and about the group of friends. And I actually have uh, uh, the statement on behalf of the group of uh, friends. So uh, let me please share with you this uh, statement. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, friends, I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the group of friends of the family which consists of 25 UN member states from all regions of the world. We welcome today's event uh, in commemoration of the International Day of Families that provides an opportunity to promote awareness of and increase knowledge about the social economic challenges affecting the family, uh, including impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The group of friends reaffirms the importance of the role of the family as the natural and fundamental group unit of society. Being a beneficiary and an active contributor to the development process, the family requires constant protection by society and by the state. Uh, as envisaged in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and legally binding documents, in particular, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on many spheres of life. It particularly affects family life in both direct and indirect ways and has created new difficulties in various aspects of family life, such as social isolation, employment instability, it has also increased the risks of mental health conditions. We recognize the efforts at the local, regional, and national levels in employing a variety of family-oriented responses to COVID-19. It is important to promote research on the family and family policies and programs, especially in post-COVID-19 recovery. The group of friends expresses its support for the preparations and observance of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family in 2024, 
through practical initiatives, including family responsible policies. In this regard, the group is ready for constructive cooperation with all UN member states, international organizations, as well as civil society and other relevant stakeholders. We thank all partners for co-organizing this event. I thank you very much. Ambassador Ribikoff, many, many thanks for your statement today and also for your hard work in organizing the group of Friends of the Family and also this conference today. And so I, I, uh, we give the floor to uh, Ambassador Althani uh, from Qatar. Thank you very much. And I, I would like to as well uh, uh, thank the, the permanent mission of Belarus to the United Nations for organizing and convening this online event on the protection of the family and family-oriented policies in the times of COVID-19. Um, of course, um, I would like to again take the opportunity as well to, to thank and express our gratitude to all members of the group of Friends on the Family. Let me, let me just emphasize that there are enormous challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic that have disrupted all aspects of the daily life and relieved the urgent need for the protection of the family and family-oriented policies. As we embark on the recovery of the pandemic, urgent actions are needed to prevent any longer lasting negative impacts and to ensure that policies and support measures pay special attention to ensure the well being of the families and the right of everyone to work and live in dignity. We truly believe that supporting the family is the first step in the advancement of the society as a whole and a fundamental pillar of social development policies. The state of Qatar, of course, places fundamental importance in all issues related to the promotion and protection of the well-being of the family and its members, and has well-established policies and programs to support families so that they can thrive and prosper. Allow me to highlight that since the onset of the pandemic, uh, of, um, the policies of the government of the state of Qatar were geared towards mitigating the effects of the pandemic on all families in the state of Qatar and their members. Uh, Qatar is very proud yeah. that it has facilitated the past 15 years on behalf of the group of uh, G77 and China, the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly on the International Year of the Family. This resolution, of course, provided the opportunity to raise awareness of the objectives of the International Year of the Family. And of course, um, we have consistently presented the, the, this resolution annually with a special focus um, as well on, on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on, on families around the world. Let me conclude by thanking you again for this opportunity, and we will continue to work together on supporting and promoting uh, the, uh, the rights and protection of the family around the world. Thank you again, Mr. Austin. Ambassador, uh, thank you so much for uh, your comments and for your very hard work on behalf of the family at the United Nations. We have fond memories of working with your government now many, many years ago in establishing the Doha Institute. Uh, and uh, we recall fondly Richard Wilkins uh, of uh, BYU Law School. Um, it is Thank now you, uh, my uh, honor to call upon uh, the permanent representative of the government of Saudi Arabia to the United Nations, uh, a very powerful voice uh, uh, in the halls of the United Nations, and uh, and we're we're pleased to have Saudi Arabia involved in in the group of friends of the family. And uh, so now we give the mic uh, to uh, His Excellency uh, Abdallah Al Mulimi. Uh, forgive my pronunciation. The the mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, I would. Uh represent uh, the, my mission, my country's mission on behalf of His Excellency. We would like to thank our friends from the permanent mission of Belarus to the United Nations for convening this meeting on the protection of the family and family-oriented policies in the time of COVID-19. The Saudi governmental system states and uh, under Article 10, the state will aspire to strengthen family ties, maintain its Arab and Islamic values and care for all its members, and to provide the right, the right conditions for the growth of their resources and capabilities. As for the uh, procedural definition, is every family that resided on the territory of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia during the period of COVID-19 pandemic, whether Saudi or non-Saudi. 
based on the Saudi government's firm belief that a tight-knit family is the kernel of a tolerant and inclusive society. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has launched 140 two initiatives, as well as several measures and policies, with a total allocation of more than 240 billion Saudi reals. Collectively, these initiatives and policies have contributed to mitigate, mitigate the, the socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic, which have cast a shadow over individuals, businesses, and investors, and families who have the largest share of these initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to briefly list some of them, which include, but not limited to, several areas, notably health, social, social economic, educational, and judicial spheres, spheres. The Saudi government has provided the best health services to all family members, ensuring the society's safety is a top priority in the health care sector. It has provided free health care to all citizens and all residents, including legal immigrants in all health facilities without penalizing them. In addition, the Ministry of Health has launched several mobile applications to ensure beneficiaries access to health services, as well as increase awareness campaigns to reach all members of society. On the social front, the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development has launched several initiatives to assist affected families, including allocating 250 million Saudi reals for the first phase of food distribution to families. In addition, the Ministry, with cooperation with the General Authority of Endowment, Awqaf, uh, have launched the Community Fund Initiative allocating 500 million Saudi reals to activate the nonprofit sector's role in reducing the socioeconomic impacts on affected families. It also launched the National Volunteer Portal, which aims to regulate voluntary work, voluntary work in the country. Initiatives to reduce violence have also been launched, including the activation of the remote consultations, counseling, and interviewing initiatives, as well as public dialogue sessions and lectures on domestic violence protection. The establishment of the Domestic Violence Reporting Center and uh, the enactment of strict laws against uh, uh, aggressors have greatly helped in the reduction of domestic violence. In addition, the Family Affairs Council, in collaboration with UNICEF, has created a manual for protecting children during the, uh, the period of pandemic. In this context, and as a part of its efforts to strengthen family bonds, the Family Affairs Council has launched a number of initiatives and programs aimed at parents, trainers, family members, and social stakeholders. Among the proceedings are the Barron's Manual Initiative, which is called Family First, which includes a set of general guidelines to assist the remote working parents in overcoming the crisis and promoting and maintaining family cohesion, as well as the launch of a mobile application, FamCare, and this app, and this app aims to help family members by offering social and psychological remote free counseling services. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I would advise you to uh, visit the Family Affairs Council website to, to learn more about the uh, pandemic's uh, various proceedings, policies, and uh, initiate, initiatives uh, have been taken uh, uh, through, uh, through this crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to mitigate the financial and economic, economic effect of the pandemic, the private sector stimulus uh, office uh, urged investors, company, companies, and small and medium enterprises to take advantages of the initiatives launched by the custodian of the two holy mosques, totaling more than thir uh, 36 billion Saudi reals. It benefits approximately 
five, uh, 15,511 uh, uh, presence of businesses and several de development projects. And the private sector workers receive a monthly uh, compensation equal to 60% of their wages. The Social Development Bank. Development Bank has uh, except, uh, accepted 39,000 borrowers from the most vulnerable families, people with disabilities, and the elderly. It also provided financial assistance to micro entrepreneurs in the amount of 9 billion Saudi reals. The Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development also launched an initiative to provide 3,000 Saudi reals per month to Saudi men and women working uh, in delivery services. Aside from capacity building initiatives for free education and training courses delivered via remote, via remote training platforms. In collaboration with the with Munshaat, the General Authority, uh, the Enterpr Enterprises uh, General Authority, the Ministry of Commerce and Investment has also provided support to small, micro and uh, enterprise through the launch of six initiatives that have contributed to the support of over than 1,513 families. In terms of education, the Ministry of Education has taken precautionary measures to ensure the continuity of education in the event of uh, uh, in the event of coronavirus outbreak it began developing and uh, developing an emergency plan and awareness campaigns for families and students to implement following the closure of academic institutions in this regard, create education content as well as technological and interact interactive solutions that have aided in the continuity of remote educa education uh, through the AIN National Education Portal, the YouTube Education Channel, 20 television channels, and more than 8 million hours of online contact to assist 3.5 uh virtual classrooms it is worth noting that the ministry of justice ensured that the justice and judiciary facilities continued to provide adequate service to individuals and families during the covid 19 pandemic it has introduced the nages platform and the uh, the 1950 line call center uh, in this in this sense the remote litigation platform, electronic marriage and the divorce contracts platform, uh, provisions of civil, uh, civil registries remotely via AppShare online platform and mobile application and other services and initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, I would like to reiterate that the Saudi government has identified family as a development priority as evidenced, evidenced by the Saudi National Vision 2030. Several plans, policies, and programs have been established to ensure its stability, protection, and growth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know how very difficult it is to step uh, step in at the last moment uh, when you're not expected to be the speaker. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. Thank and you very much for convening this uh, uh, this event, which is uh, very important. And uh, unfortunately, the the ambassador was uh, um, uh, he looked forward to attending this meeting. Actually, he uh, he canceled one of his meetings to attend this meeting, but unfortunately something uh, uh, happened at the last moment. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a topic that we all uh, uh, take care of, and it's very important as a part of our um, national values. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you again very much. Thank you. Please, uh, please send him uh, our very best. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, I will now call upon um, the, uh, the deputy permanent representative of the Russian Federation. Um, the Russian Federation has been extremely helpful uh, for the past many years in, uh, in the debates on sexual and reproductive health, on, uh, on, on family, 
uh, and, and many other issues related to the family. So uh, it is a, is a point of pride for, for us uh, to welcome uh, the Deputy Prime Representative uh, from the Russian Federation, uh, His Excellency Gennady Kuzmin. Uh, sir, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Austin. Th many thanks for nice words towards the Russian Federation in particular. Uh, and I'm very, it's my privilege and I'm very pleased to participate in such an important event. And you know how the Russian Federation pays much attention to the family issues. It's a very important topic for us. And uh, let me, dear, dear participants, uh, I, uh, the Russian Federation aligns itself with the statement delivered by the permanent representative of the Republic of Belarus, Mr. Valentin Rybakov, on behalf of the group of friends of the family. And we commend Belarus for coordinating the work of the group of friends and thank it for the initiating today's event in collaboration with the civil society. The topic of this year's commemoration is very timely as COVID-19 hit the fundamental group unit of society the most. Every family experienced the negative effects of the pandemic, which interrupted the provisions of social economic support and protection. Some family members lost their jobs. Some were more exposed to the virus and isolated from their family being frontline workers. Children could not go to schools and kindergartens. Parents had to multitask among remote working, educating their children at home and domestic work. This is a very short list of many challenges faced by the family and its members. The pandemic made it obvious that states need to better implement their obligation on protecting the family. COVID-19 response and recovery policies need to be family responsive, to leave no one behind and to build back better. Support to the family needs to be mainstreamed in all socioeconomic measures at national, regional and international levels. As a contributor to a force of development, the family needs to play a greater role in achieving more prosperous future for all. Having said that, we appreciate the efforts of family-oriented NGOs and civil society representatives and call on them to be more active in all the process and events where provided by rules of procedure, methods of work and or respective modalities resolutions. The Russian Federation reaffirms its commitment to the protection of and support to the family as a funda fundamental group unit of society. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and again, uh, our, our, our thanks uh, to, uh, to you and your mission and uh, all the staff that have been there over these many years. Um, and I have uh, very fond memories of, of uh, visiting uh, Moscow uh, and uh, visiting with some of your colleagues in the foreign ministry. And, uh, you know, I look forward to coming again one of these days. So, uh, you know, warm regards uh, from me personally and my organization and other pro-family people here in the United States. Uh, again, thanks so much to all of uh, the uh, representatives of the UN member states who spoke today. Uh, if, if any more join the queue at some point over the next uh, hour or so, we, we will certainly invite them in to, uh, to make a statement. There will be NGO statements at the end after the panel, and uh, we would, uh, like I said, welcome uh, uh, UN member states to, to jump in and, and, and make statements. This, after all, is, uh, is uh, a creation of UN member states, um, and, uh, and we work with them, and we're grateful to work with them. So thank you all, uh, and like I said, if anybody wants to jump in, please, please let us know. Uh, I think you can do that in the chat, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, we're now moving to a roundtable discussion. We have four very important uh, uh, speakers um, who will discuss various aspects of the family, uh, speakers from uh, around the United States and also around the world. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce uh, each speaker individually, and then they will, they will present their material, uh, and then uh, we will move on to the next speaker. Uh, so the first speaker will be Dr. Uh, Sharifa al Amadi, uh, who is currently the executive director of uh, 
of the uh, Doha International Family Institute. I'll just remind everyone that it was an honor for uh, American pro-life organizations to participate in the founding of the Doha Institute. Now, gosh, I would think 20 years ago. Uh, so it is a delight for us to, to have uh, Dr. El Imadi uh, join us today. She is uh, a member also of the Qatar Foundation and a global policy and advocacy, which is a global policy and advocacy institute working to advance knowledge on Arab families and promote evidence-based policies. Uh, Dr. Al Amadi, uh, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, dear Chair, thank you uh, very much for giving me this chance to uh, present our finding in the impact of COVID-19 on adolescent well-being. Uh, we will focus here exploring family factors. Uh, we, we will hear today some positive uh, information about the pandemic related to families. So let me give you some information here. So our project started by an idea examining the impact of intervention program on adolescent uh, well-being. This program was focusing in the, uh, to uh, examine the protective factor and the risk factor to uh, protect our ch children from this uh, different destructive behavior. We uh, uh, like uh, work in, in uh, pre-questionnaire, then to implement a program, and then we uh, uh, have to do the post-questionnaire to see uh, how the, the impact of this program, and this program was fo uh, focused in educating family related to uh, their uh, children well-being. So what happened that we did the, pre uh, the uh, uh, pre-questionnaire on 26th of January uh, to 12th of February 2020, and then we did the intervention program, uh, but in, with one of, uh, of the schools, then the pandemic is, is, uh, started. So we, uh, due to the lockdown, uh, we start, uh, we weren't uh, able to, to do the intervention program for all the schools. And we uh, like were uh, changed the thinking related to this uh, uh, study. So we uh, did the, the, the post questionnaire to examine the impact of pandemic on the, the relationship or the, the uh, uh, our adolescent well-being. So we did the post questionnaire on 23rd of April uh, and, uh, and uh, until uh, like 17 of, uh, of uh, uh, May, and uh, we focused, uh, we asked them like uh, 68 uh, uh, questions. These questions uh, relate to uh, four uh, uh, pillars, family factors, uh, peer group, general well-being, and different uh, activities uh, relate to uh, sports and activities related to the, uh, uh, like uh, our uh, children. Uh, we will focus here in, in just the, the family uh, relationship. So uh, our uh, uh, sample size was uh, 1,157 in uh, pre-questionnaire. Then uh, in the post-questionnaire became 442. Uh, still, uh, uh, with the, the margin of error, it's okay because it is uh, 4,836 uh, percent, which is uh, acceptable. Most of our sample size was uh, from uh, the public school, 52 uh, percent. Uh, uh, in uh, pre questionnaire and uh, 75 uh, percent uh, in post questionnaire, then uh, the others from uh, Qatar Foundation School and private school. We tried to take different ideas from different uh, kinds of school because it was uh, important for us. Um, also, uh, the gender was most of them uh, female, 60% pre-questionnaire, 57% uh, in uh, post-questionnaire. Our sample size, sorry to say that, uh, I didn't say that, they are from 12 years old until uh, 14 years old. So the result, I will try to, to do it as quickly as I can for in 10 minutes. So. Uh, we know that spending more time is very important. So, the, 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 uh, and one of the important of, uh, protective factor that will protect our children from different kind of behavior. So, we ask them a question related to that. The percentage of those who spend more than 
30 hours a week with their families increased from 29% to 45%, showing an increase of almost 16%. So, so this is one of the positive things that happened uh, during the uh, pandemic. The other things like relationship with their parents, so with their mother, normally it was, uh, it was very good, like in the pre-questionnaire, 94%, which is okay, became 96%, but still increased about 2% in the post questionnaire. So even it's the quality time. So they spent more time with their children, but still we can see even the quality time was uh, okay. Um, we relate to uh, the relationship with their father, normally uh, 19, uh, 90% was uh, okay in the pre-questionnaire became 20, 92%, so there is a, a slight increase, about 2% in the post-questionnaire result. And it's noted that the percentage of those who described his hair father as not to present was estimated at 2.07% in the pre-questionnaire and 1.70% in the post-questionnaire uh, post result, which shows that even the, the, the father now, it's more uh, like uh, have more relationship uh, with their children than uh, before. Uh, the uh, uh, eating meals or, or during the meals, we communicate with our children and it's very important to uh, like uh, even uh, be a role model for them and learn from us uh, too much things during that. So the, uh, the, during uh, the meals, we, we saw that there is increase of 18% in the post questionnaire. So uh, increase in the, the children who, who eat meals with uh, their uh, parents uh, like uh, during the pandemic, which is very good even. Can I, um, uh, we ask them, can I easily, easily receive emotional support from my mother, which is increased 5%. In the almost always respond, so we can see that there is increase even in in uh, the uh, emotional uh, support with their mothers. We will see relate to um, uh, if their parents uh, uh, they know where they they spend the time uh, during the evening. We know that the fear of of uh, disease and the pandemic, so they focus too much on their children. So the uh, we can see that there is. Uh, increase of about 10% that, that their parents knew where they were in the evening, which is even uh, something positive. Uh, uh, my mother and father set different rules about what I can and cannot do uh, outside uh, the house. This is one of the uh, even uh, uh, question we asked them. Specifically, the percentage increase in the almost always uh, category from 28.78% uh, to 44.84%, uh, uh, showing an increase of almost 16%, which is even related to pandemic. What is the rule? I think uh, wearing mask, distance, these things. So it's uh, already changed uh, uh, with them. Also, uh, Reading books in our culture is normally it's not that much with their children. So in our culture, they prefer to do different activities, uh, staying in majlis, let's say, or uh, playing some games together, but not reading. So we can see even increase about 7% in the post questionnaire result. So they start to read with, with ch ch their children, which is uh, even positive. And the, the parent uh, or the children that they feel that they're or they said that their uh, parents don't read uh, with them. They were 59% uh, uh, in the pre questionnaire, 49%. That's showing a, dec a decrease of about 10% in the post questionnaire that parents, they read more with the, their children. And the violence, this is what surprised for us because we heard, or we heard, and we we heard even from the speakers uh, today that there is increase in the violence during the pandemic. But in this research, what we discovered that the percentage of family members who argue in a scary way, we asked them in the pre questionnaire and post questionnaire, decreased from 25% in the pre questionnaire result to 15% in the post-questionnaire result, showing an overall decrease of 
10%, which is something uh, uh, even positive. Relate to physical violence, it's decreased from 18% in the pre-questionnaire to 9% in the post-questionnaire, uh, uh, which may indicate the decrease in the rate of uh, physical violence also. So this is uh, uh, exactly a, uh, yeah, a few of our results. I, I, uh, you can enter even um, uh, see all the results relate to all to 60 eight uh, question inshallah in uh, our website uh, you can find even um, most uh, more than uh, this but our recommendation we will conduct this study because we did it as a pilot study but we didn't do the intervention program so we have to do it uh, again and uh, to uh, uh, like uh, focus on the risk factor and uh, uh, protective factor relate to uh, adolescent uh, but uh, also, uh, we uh, we want to come with the program to support uh, more the family uh, here to an uh, inter uh, like national uh, and the government or to implement it in uh, national. So, but what we came from this uh, study that it's uh, we have to uh, even. Uh, like uh, implement different policies related to uh, uh, work family balance. We already have a study related to, to that. So we uh, really want to uh, focus more enhancing leave policy, maternity leave, paternity leave. We uh, want to improve uh, children care and uh, uh, arrangement like nurseries and uh, like um, uh, 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 some uh, uh, nurseries even in workplace uh, breastfeeding hours it's uh, extra and stream flexible working arrangement which is very uh, important and how to implement some policies related to working from home because what we saw this is even uh, uh, has a positive impact in, in our children and our relationship with uh, our children thank you very much and uh, uh, i'm very happy to to present this result and uh, see you inshallah for more results thank you Dr. Um, Elamati, may I ask you what time it is where you are? Uh, I'm in uh, Qatar, Doha, Qatar, and the time is exactly 10.49 uh, uh, p.m. Oh, so it's not as late as I thought. I thought it, I thought it might be a little bit later, and I, you, know, you, get, you get an award anyway. If it's up after 12, I, I'm very happy to be with you and present. <laughs> it's way past my bedtime. Uh, you know, one of your questions I thought was really interesting about, do, do you know what your children are doing in the evening? And uh, I'm old enough to remember on American television at 10 o'clock every night, there was an ad that said, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Uh, so I, <laughs> they don't do that anymore. They don't, they don't care much anymore. So we will do it inshallah in Doha. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, and I just want to point one thing out that strikes me as we go through all the speakers and also in the work that we do at the United Nations is I call this the true ecumenism. And that is people of different but strong faiths who band, you put aside our differences and band together to, to fight for the things that we agree on. And, and what, one thing that inevitably happens is friendships form, love grows. Um, it, is, it is quite remarkable what we see at the United Nations. And, and so uh, we're delighted to have you and, and thank you so much for, for your work, your study and your comments today. Um, it, is, it is my uh, real pleasure uh, to, uh, to introduce a friend uh, who has uh, been in his presence many times at conferences, and he's spoken at conferences that, that uh, CFAM has, uh, has uh, 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 hosted at the United Nations. And that is Mark Regnerus, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, uh, he has done groundbreaking work on the importance of children and moms and dads and uh, what was was very important in the marriage debates that happened here in the United States a few years ago and ongoing. Um, his research is in the area of sexual behavior, family, marriage, and religion. He's the author of uh, over 40 published articles and book chapters and four books. Uh, he is uh, an utterly charming man. Um, uh, and I'm happy to say that I have also met his wife. Uh, it is just a delight for us to have with us today, Mark Regnerus. Mark, welcome. Uh, the microphone is yours. Uh, thank you, Austin. 
And uh, I remember those uh, adventures well. And uh, you reminded me of meeting my wife. And uh, I just had to go and shush her in the other room because she's talking to our, our, our oldest college student who's on his way home after finishing. So uh, good times here. I want to talk a little bit today about so sort of the state of the, the science in marriage and family well-being uh, in this last basically 13 to 15 months. Uh, so just to get right into it, I mean, how, households have changed uh, in, a, in a short amount of time. Some places they've changed more rapidly and readily than others. And I'd say that in, in perhaps here in the West, uh, and especially in the United States, We've uh, moved in towards a more multi-generational model that many of you representatives here probably think, well, this is just this normal. And that's, uh, it's unusual for the United States in ways I think that are, are, uh, can be um, uh, challenging to us, but also uh, areas of growth. I know a million and a half Canadians moved home back in with their parents last spring double that number, about 3 million American adults moved in with a parent or grandparent also last spring. And yet this has been changing for a little while already because Americans, uh, as you see in this slide, have been slowly, more of them have been moving home to live with their parents uh, starting around 2005, 2010. Now you look at the over there on the, the Y axis, I mean, we're, we're still only about 15, 16%. So some of you would think, well, we've got a long way to go on this, but uh, it is true that uh, there's a surge in multi-generational homes. There's also been a surge, at least a brief surge for sure in, um, uh, or should say brief decline in marriage rates. Uh, and it's disheartening, it's not unexpected. The key question I think is, will it be a simply a delay or will there be an absolute decline from this? Uh, and as friends of marriage and family, I think all of us uh, would, would agree that to see a, a wide decline and a permanent decline would be very disheartening. Um, I don't know if it will be a wide and permanent decline, but uh, uh, in terms of an absolute uh, move away from marriage, but in a book I released last year, uh, uh, on, on marriage around the world, every time we took population-based data and evaluated the effects of marital delay on the overall uh, share of people who were married or eventually married, we always saw that a delay meant a, an absolute decline, not necessarily a radical one, but um, anytime you see people saying, oh, it's just people are pushing it off until they're you know, into the later 20s or into the early 30s and more settled, we know that that delay means that some people who very much wish to be married um, will not be married in the future, in part because of this sort of massive uh, delay. Now, um, also, we, it's obvious that there was an increase in social isolation for some people during the COVID era. And sometimes this actually had you know, even a health uh, cost, as a, a, a Swedish study revealed that unmarried men and women were one and a half to twice as times likely to have perished from COVID or COVID related symptoms um, in, in Sweden. Now, it, you do think like, okay, there's this increasing social isolation that's going on. At the same time, there's a surge in multi-generational homes. And so obviously where people move back together and back home, and one of the key reasons that people moved back home was not necessarily because they needed it or lost their jobs, although that is true in some cases, it's that they wanted to be around people and that they'd even pick their parents if they had to. So um, we saw increasing social isolation, but uh, whenever we saw people moving together to be back with parents, um, the, the general socialization processes that kick in uh, benefited. And so some households in the COVID era have flourished. Now I just wanna show you a little, statistic from this American study, and I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about a couple other studies from outside the United States in a second, but this is a study from a, an organization that I'm generally not a fan of, although we tend to use the same data, and so I know that they have pretty good data, but I also know that they're not going to sort of uh, uh, lie to me with it because it's publicly accessible. Ages 30 to 50, they found that three quarters of uh, married Americans said the pandemic actually strengthened their marriage, even more said that made them appreciate their spouse. Uh, at the same time, you hold these things in tension because 
almost two thirds of them said the pandemic was, is very stressful on, on their family. Almost a third of them said it was testing their marriage. But then you get down to sort of the, the, the share of people who think about leaving or separating or divorcing. There's only about 16%. You might say, well, 16% in a, in a consolidated year is a lot. At the same time, on any given year, there are a fair amount of uh, married Americans, probably close to that number, who are actively thinking about this. Generally speaking, they don't actually separate. Overall, though, marital satisfaction, emotional satisfaction, which has kind of become the key uh, uh, marker of, of happy marriage, um, has not really shifted much. So we've got uh, a lot more moving home. We've got some households are flourishing. Those who lacked economic means but still had to pack in together, those are the most stressed of families, as is, uh, that makes sense logical sense. All right, here's just a snapshot from a different survey, the American Family Survey, reinforcing what the, the survey I just talked about said. Uh, when you look at the, the share of married people saying their marriage is in trouble from 2019 to 2020, the, the share that said, no, it's not in trouble actually increased. And the share that said, yes, it's in trouble decreased. So I think you get a sense of when people rely on their marriage for, for what in part it is there for, um, they can come to find that, you know, ah, this is what marriage is. And ah, it works when I really need it to work. It works when we, we, we put it, our heads together and say, hey, we're, we're stuck together, let's get along. To reinforce this point just a little bit further, um, people agreed that over half of, people uh, in the United States agree that the pandemic deepened their commitment to marriage. More people agreed than disagreed, far more. And they made their, and appreciate their partner more. So I, I think the take home message is when we hear negative remarks about marriage during COVID, uh, I think we need to set it into context of what else is going on around, um, uh, what else is going on inside the household, because marriage as an interdependent institution is, is meant to weather troubles. It's meant to be a, a load bearing wall. And so we're, we're actually seeing that. Now you will see plenty of, and hear plenty of remarks. And we heard it from the beginning last spring about concerns about violence within the household. Um, one of the disappointments when I was asked to talk about this uh, general topic, and I went to sort of study the, the, the recent literature from the past year about uh, both family health and violence inside the household. One of the things I was very frustrated with is it was difficult to find research that actually distinguished between kinds of relationship inside the household, right? So I list here something called intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, at the, and that you folks in the UN are quite familiar with these terms. Um, but I, I found that most of the research in this area woefully inattentive to the nature of that intimate relationship. Uh, because it's just obvious that uh, you know, from the data I'm familiar with, some relationship forms are both more unstable and more prone to violence than other forms. And so when I see social scientists and, and here it's, it's actually, especially Western social scientists, increasingly ignoring this distinction uh, between types of relationship. Is this a cohabiting relationship? Is this a very short-term relationship? Is this a marriage? Um, it's, just, it's just maddening to me as a social scientist uh, because that's just, that's just poor social, sciences, social science when that happens. I saw an Argentine study, excellent. They had the data, right? 1,502 Argentine women. They had the, the, the distinction between marriage and un, uh, relationships that were not marriage, and they did not talk about its effect. I saw an Austrian study also had the data, but they did not map the influence of marriage. Elsewhere, though, I think they're paying a little bit more attention. I came across an Indian study of 400 adults last April. They noted that the the development of anxiety 
in the COVID era, lockdowns uh, was 40% lower among people who were married than people who were not married. A Nigerian study last April and May noted that married females coped better while self-employed singles recorded the highest stress. So um, overall, there is not a whole lot of data yet out on the subject. There's a lot more on you know, like what cures, you know, what, can, you know, what can get rid of COVID? What can, uh, you know, how effective are the, the, the vaccines? Uh, we see a lot more evidence on that stuff. When it comes to social science on family relations and violence, we see uh, much less. However, very little of the sort of the, the, the data I'm seeing matches the kind of consensus terminology that you hear in the, the UN about um, you know, intimate partner violence, gender-based violence. What I see is sort of uh, marriage pays dividends. So with that, I will conclude. You know, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, really in interesting information. Um, just a, a personal note, you know, it's, it's hard to say this because so many people suffered greatly uh, during COVID, uh, but for many others, it was almost a blessed time uh, for my family and I, you know, our, our girls were home during the day uh, we were all there. Uh, we spent our days, you know, in the backyard. I, I was working on a book. The children were jumping on the trampoline. You know, the the, the neighbor kids uh, were um, were uh, bonded together in a way that we had never seen before. There were 15 neighborhood kids traveling in a pack all over the neighborhood. Uh, we sat in the backyard watching the chickens. It, it was a really blessed time. How was it for you, Mark? Well, you know, an introvert, I mean, I may not come off as an introvert, but introvert like me, it, it, you know, day to day, it didn't seem a whole lot different, right? Uh, so, you know, we had college kids come back for uh, several months and then, then they went back in the fall and did not return. Um, so insofar as we can convey a sense of, uh, of normal life, um, it has been fine. Um, at the same time, I, I, I recognize that, uh, uh, it came down hard, the pandemic, on people who lacked employment security. At the same time, family is supposed to be about this, sort of like when there are crises, we turn towards each other to help each other. And so moving back home um, is not inherently a problem, even in the United States. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I'm very grateful for your data. I, I, I have a feeling we're going to be writing about your data this week uh, in the Friday Facts. So uh, thank you, Mark, uh, for coming on. Uh, I am told uh, by my uh, colleague, Lisa Carenti, that the ambassador uh, from um, Egypt has arrived and uh, we welcome him uh, to make a statement. Um, uh, we are delighted to welcome uh, His Excellency Mohammed. Idris, um, Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Austin. Thank you very much. Allow me to join in thanking all participants and uh, just apologize that I, I joined late because uh, currently I'm the chair of the Peace Building Commission and I was engaging in another meeting in that capacity. So in this uh, cyber uh, space and the virtual meetings, lots of overlaps happening, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, of course, I couldn't miss being in this important meeting to commemorate the International Day of the Families and uh, to thank our uh, co-chairs of this uh, important group, the Belarus and Qatar, and uh, to thank the uh, great support of civil society and academia in this endeavor. And uh, just to, to also to highlight that we, we share uh, this uh, uh, keenness uh, as you do, and that the Egyptian constitution contains a special provision assuring that family is the basis of society. And it also uh, mentioned the role of the state in protecting the cohesion, stability, and consolidation of the family values. And of course, uh, despite the multiple challenges that families worldwide are currently facing, it is essential to note that the, uh, to note the positive role the family plays uh, on different levels. Examples include ensuring that children's education continuity during uh, the school closures, uh, taking the extra care duties because of the limitations 
uh, or the unavailability of care services and like, the stress and anxiety associated with the pandemic socioeconomic impact. And this uh, socioeconomic impact to families is one of Egypt's priorities during the current time since the pandemic outbreak, the Egyptian government decided to expand the social protection program known uh, as uh, uh, solidarity and dignity uh, by including additional uh, 100,000 new households to the beneficiaries. And the program implemented by the Ministry of Social Solidarity mainly provides family income support aimed at increasing food consumption, reduction of poverty, while encouraging families to keep children in school and providing them with needed health care. The program is also part of the social safety net and one of the government's mechanisms to develop social protection systems and link the families in need to development indicators in order to enhance access by poor households to their basic rights. Last March in Egypt, the uh, Positive Family uh, pa uh, Parenting Program was uh, launched. The program is another social protection uh, mechanism that effort that uh, offers the to the most needed families sessions on key parenting domains uh, such as primary care, early childhood uh, development, social uh, upbringing, emotional and psychological development of the child, and positive discipline. So, just to uh, conclude, uh, I think this group of friends offers a significant contribution to advocating the role of the family and the family-oriented policies aiming to invest in people, build healthy relationships between the family members, and to protect our societies facing this dreadful socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19. I thank you very much, and it's a great honor to benefit from the valuable contribution in this session. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have fond memories of working with your delegation these many, many years in defending life and family, and you have been a stalwart in, uh, in, uh, in working with pro-life and pro-family groups. So I thank you, and I thank you for joining us today. Um, we uh, will continue with our panel on the family, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Melissa uh, Michella, who is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Catholic University of, uh, of America. Uh, we have many friends at CUA, um, so we are delighted to, uh, to welcome you here. Um, uh, Melissa teaches uh, and her research focuses on natural law, biomedical ethics, and uh, the moral and political status of the family. She is also a McDonald Distinguished Fellow in the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University School of Law. Uh, again, we are delighted to have you, and uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Um, my presentation today is going to focus on how uh, protecting parental rights uh, supports children's well-being and to give a kind of deeper dive into understanding the foundations of parental rights uh, and the policies that would be required to fully respect and protect those rights. Um, so just to kind of frame the, the topic, I have here a, a quote from Melissa Harris Perry, uh, a political scientist who in 2013 on MSNBC uh, said the following. She said, we have to break through the kind of private idea that children belong to their parents or children belong to their families and recognize that children belong to whole communities. And this, you know, these comments for obvious reasons ignited furious public discussion. And the reason it was so controversial is that her statement implies that the whole community, that is the state, not the parents, has primary authority to decide how to raise children. And just to see kind of what's at stake here, let me discuss a concrete case, one of many that I could cite. Uh, this happened in uh, 2009. It's the case of, of Dominic Johansson. The seven-year-old Dominic Johansson and his parents were on an airplane uh, to leave Europe permanently for the mother's home country of India when armed police uh, entered the plane and took Dominic into custody. 
on the grounds uh, that he was homeschooled and that this constituted neglect, despite the fact that school was not in session at the time and that homeschooling was legal at the time. Dominic was then kept in foster care for several years with extremely limited uh, ability for the parents to visit him. And eventually after a protracted court battle, the court definitively terminated the Johansson's parental rights in 2012. And the European Court of Human Rights upheld that decision in January of 2015. Now, what happened to Dominic Johansson and his parents is perfectly right if children belong primarily to the whole community as Melissa Harris Perry would have it. Because if that's true, when the community's officials disagree with what the parents are doing, then they can step in and take over. Um, this means that the state is going to use its coercive power to impose its controversial views about child well being and ensure as much as possible that children are raised in accordance with those views, even if it means taking children away from parents. Now, this was obviously one extreme case of one child in one country, but the threats to parental rights are. Uh, much broader. For instance, in many places, there are grave concerns about compre uh, controversial comprehensive sex ed programs that often have no opt out or very limited opt outs for parents who object to the way that the school presents these sensitive issues. In many public schools in my own country, for example, sex ed programs encourage young teenagers to explore topics like sadomasochistic sex play porn stars and bestiality. Students as young as 10 or 11 are exposed to graphic curricula explaining you know, various types of solitary and mutual sexual acts and being advised that activities like sexting and pornography or showering naked with one's uh, partner are risk-free alternatives to intercourse that are part of a sexually abstinent lifestyle. Another related major concern is uh, gender ideology and a growing number of schools curricula infused with gender ideology encourage children to experiment with different gender identities and confuse children by denying biological reality. Some curricula, for instance, instruct teachers to avoid using terms like boys and girls when teaching about bodily changes during puberty but instead to speak of people with penises and people with vaginas. And schools in some places have protocols that allow children to transition socially to the opposite gender at school uh, while parents are being kept in the dark about the fact that the child is struggling uh, with his or her gender identity. And parents of gender confused children may even be forced to consent to uh, puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones for their children or risk losing custody. Some parents have even uh, lost custody of their children for not wanting to put their children through these their experimental and irreversible uh, treatments. Even though these treatments are risky uh, and experimental, they cause irreversible changes to children's bodies. Many later regret them uh, as the UK High Court uh, recognized in its recent uh, Tavistock decision. Uh, also, many public schools attempt to implement highly, highly ideological, quote unquote, diversity education or citizenship education programs uh, present similar worries. Uh, this issue is highlighted in one US uh, court case, uh, Mozart v. Hawkins from 1984, in which uh, evangelical Christian parents wanted to exempt their children from a diversity oriented reading curriculum that they believed fostered religious relativism and was harmful to their children. The court, however, denied the parents request, arguing that the state had an interest in preparing children for citizenship in a pluralist society. And more generally, uh, studies have found that there is widespread uh, textbook bias against more conservative moral and uh, religious views in readers and in social studies textbooks across the board. And while uh, in the US at least, uh, parents technically do have the ability to send their children to private schools or to homeschool them, even though homeschooling is illegal in many other countries, still many parents uh, who don't have the resources to send their child to private school or to homeschool 
will find themselves stuck with no alternative but to send their children into an environment that they think could be quite harmful to them. And if people like uh, Harris Perry and, and many, many other prominent scholars had their way, homeschooling would be illegal everywhere and private schools, if tolerated at all, would be required to include these controversial elements in their curricula. So I wanna spend a few minutes thinking more deeply about why Harris Perry's claim that children belong not to their parents, but to the whole community is fundamentally flawed. Um, so why don't children belong to the state? Well, we see articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this recognition that the family is the natural and fundamental uh, group unit of society and is entitled to protection uh, we see also that uh, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, which is deeply connected with parental rights because many parents understand their uh, obligations to raise their children in accordance with particular values and a particular faith as a extremely uh, grave and important religious duty. And it's certainly for all parents a matter of, of conscience. Um, and then lastly, directly, the UDHR states that parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. So what are the kind of deeper foundations of these rights that are recognized uh, in the Universal Declaration? Well, parental rights are really about parents' authority to make decisions about what is in the best interests of their children. So to understand where parental rights come from, we need to understand the basis of parental authority. Everyone agrees that somebody has to have authority over children because they're not mature enough to make decisions for themselves. So the question is, who has that authority? And I believe that authority over children is derived from responsibility for children's well-being. Um, so whoever has the strongest and most direct responsibility for the child's well-being is the one who has the strongest authority to make decisions about what is in the best interests of the child. Um, and so to figure out who has primary authority over children, we need to figure out who has the closest relationship to a child, because I think that your degree of responsibility for someone's well-being depends on the closeness uh, and nature of your relationship with that, that person. And so it's clear that at least initially, um, the biological parents are the ones who have the closest uh, tie, the closest relationship to their child. I'll say something about adoptive parents in a second, but for now, I think it's important to focus on the biological parent-child relationship because it helps us understand the natural responsibilities and rights of parents which are what adoptive parents will then take on when biological parents can't or won't fulfill their natural role. Uh, the biological parent-child relationship grounds parents' primary responsibility to take care of their child until maturity. Uh, and it endows parents with the authority to carry out that task. Uh, the fact that parents are the ones who ultimately have the greatest responsibility for their children's education and upbringing has been highlighted as, as many have already pointed out uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic during which parents have been forced to play a more direct role in their children's education. And uh, as parents have seen, and we have all seen the great shortcomings of online education for children, an increasing number of parents have turned to homeschooling. And many families have actually found uh, through this experience that while it's been challenging, uh, the increased time together has been a great blessing and that their children are actually happier and learning more because there's more time and flexibility to tailor education to their children's unique needs and talents when they're being educated at home. As a result, uh, many parents uh, now say that they want to continue homeschooling even after the pandemic ends or do some kind of hybrid model of partial homeschooling, partial uh, schooling at a private or public school. It's interesting also to note that many public schools, at least in my own country, have still not returned to full-time in-person schooling. While most private schools, which unlike public schools are directly accountable to the parents, have been offering in-person schooling since at least this past fall. And of course, homeschooled children have been able to continue their education uninterrupted 
uh, throughout the pandemic. Now, what has happened with parents playing a more direct role in education due to the pandemic, uh, largely to the benefit of children, uh, also indirectly helps us to see how protecting the natural rights of parents as primary educators corresponds to the needs of children. Because of the existing relationship that's both biological and psychological that a child has with his biological parents, the child is personally dependent on those parents for the ideal fulfillment of uh, developmental needs. The parent-child relationship is unique in that it's a permanent identity-defining link uh, between parent and child, right? If I had been conceived by different parents, I wouldn't be the same person, I just wouldn't exist. Um, and so even if a child is not raised by biological parents, that link is there and it's important. It matters very much to the child. The importance of this link is underscored uh, by research that's been done on children conceived with the sperm of anonymous donors who often feel that they are deprived of a key to understanding their identity. Uh, now, what about uh, adoptive parents? Of course, in non-ideal circumstances, uh, when biological parents are unable or unwilling to raise their child, adoption will be the best option for meeting the child's needs. And adoptive parents, of course, are true parents with the same obligations and rights. But the difference is that the obligations that adoptive parents have to their children and their corresponding rights derive initially from the commitment that adoptive parents make to take on the parental role, while the obligations of biological parents derive from the already existing relationship that they have to their children. I've emphasized the biological tie here because it's the biological parent-child relationship that helps us see why the family community has a natural structure, married biological parents and their children, a structure that is not arbitrarily defined by the state and therefore this helps us see why parental authority is original and primary, not derivative of the state's authority. To borrow a metaphor from Thomas Aquinas, it's just as natural for children to be raised to maturity within the spiritual womb of their family under the authority and care of their parents, as it is for children to be gestated in the physical womb of their mothers. While physical gestation only lasts nine months, human beings have a very long period of psychological, moral, and intellectual gestation that takes place outside of the womb. And that period of gestation doesn't end until the child reaches a level of maturity at which he can direct his own life. And like the physical womb, the family is the spiritual womb, a protected sphere within which children can grow to maturity. And it's from this spiritual womb that children are then born into the larger society as adults. Thus, the family grounded in marriage is a natural authority structure that corresponds to unchanging features of human nature and deep human needs. The state didn't create that structure any more than it created a woman's womb. And it's not from the state that parents get their authority. Parents have their authority by nature and the state has no right to take it away or encroach on it. Now, of course, it's true that children are also members of the larger political community, but only indirectly. Right? Human beings are, in a sense, nested within various levels of community, like traditional Rus Russian nesting dolls. Children belong first and foremost to their families, headed by their parents. And uh, the parents are the ones with the most direct obligation and authority to take care of them until maturity. As a result, children's relationship to the political community is fundamentally different from that of adults because it's mediated through their belonging to the family and living under the authority of their parents. Just as, for instance, my relationship to the United Nations is mediated through my US citizenship. There are, of course, times when the state may be justified in breaking into the spiritual womb of the family and interfering with the way parents raise their children. But the justifications for coercive state intervention into the family sphere are few. They're similar to the justifications for international intervention into the affairs of a sovereign nation. Similar to, for instance, 
cases of very serious egregious human rights violations or threats to international peace, which would uh, justify interventions in the internal affairs of other nations. Likewise, you know, genuine abuse and neglect defined non-ideologically or a kind of serious threat to the public order in the way that parents are raising their children could justify the state stepping in. But otherwise, parents have the discretion to make the determination about what is in the best interest of their children. So just to conclude, um, these are the reasons why when it comes to making uh, controversial decisions about what's in the best interests of children, particularly in the area of moral and religious education, the authority to make those decisions uh, belongs to parents. While the state does have an interest in children's well-being and especially in ensuring that children grow up to be responsible and productive citizens, the state's job is to facilitate the parent's task, not to usurp that task, except in cases where parents are clearly abusive or neglectful, cases analogous to those in which other nations or the UN could rightfully intervene in the internal affairs of a sovereign state. So what would be required to bring education policies into line with respect for parental rights? I won't go into detail, but let me just list a few things. Um, first, uh, parents should have the right to exempt their children from controversial aspects of the curriculum in the public schools, things like comprehensive sex ed or controversial things about gender uh, and so on. Um, also, uh, parents should have the right to genuine school choice. Uh, they should have the right, obviously, to send their children to a private school. They should have the right to homeschool them. A and also, I think um, that there is no reason why uh, public schools, government-run schools, should have a monopoly on public educational funding given that parents are primary educators and educational funding could be funneled through parental choice who could then use that funding to send their children to the school of their choice that is most suitable for their child. Also, there should be minimal state interference with private and religious schools or home schools, and also uh, the rights of parents to make uh, medical decisions on behalf of their children should be uh, respected, including in controversial areas of things like gender uh, and so on, where there's been a great push uh, to usurp uh, the ability of parents to make those decisions. Um, so uh, just to, to end, right, as we saw with the controversial case of the Johansons at the outset, the failure to respect parental rights in these ways is not only an injustice to parents, but is also profoundly, profoundly harmful to children. So policies that respect the rights of parents are also, I believe, uh, one of the best ways to promote the well-being of children. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Michelle, thank you so much uh, for that enlightening presentation. I've got a quick, a couple of quick questions. Uh, what was the, what has been the final disposition of the Dominic Johansson case? Was he ever reunited with his family? What, what happened? No, no, the, the parental rights were uh, permanently terminated. And so he uh, was he could have been adopted by somebody else uh, or simply remained a ward of the state uh, until maturity. But uh, yeah, an extremely tragic case. Um, they, they kept trying to appeal even all the way up to the, the European Union, Union court, um, but they, to no avail. You know, the analogy that you drew between uh, the, the sovereign rights of parents and the sovereign rights of states these of the international institutions is right on the money and something that is uh, music to the ears of, uh, of UN diplomats who are standing up often and, and they fight for sovereignty language in, in UN documents and uh, over against those who want to take those sovereign rights away. So uh, that was that was exactly correct. And, and, and one final point, it, it seems to me, and I, I write about this in, in a book that I just published, that, that, that what we're up against is, is not just a new faith, but a new established church. Um, oh, yes. A child mm -hmm. is told uh, in the grade school right down the street from where I sit that uh, sex is assigned at birth and that mm -hmm. uh, they might be born in the wrong body. These are religious claims. Um, and, and when they force a child to uh, use, quote unquote, the proper pronouns, that they are forcing religious speech on, on children, uh, in my view. Um, so I, I, I'm very grateful for, for all the information that, that, that you gave us with regard to parental rights and, and gender and things like that. It's, 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 uh, boy, it's one of the central issues of our time. Um, yes. I've just been uh, uh, notified that uh, the ambassador from uh, 
Bangladesh has returned um, and we are delighted uh, to have uh, her um, and forgive me, I do not have her name in front of me because it got past me, but I will turn the, uh, the uh, microphone over to uh, Bangladesh. Welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you for finally recognizing me and for giving me the floor. I had actually given up hope of getting the floor at all this year. Uh, we attach high importance uh, to this group's work, so I'm very pleased to be able to share a few thoughts. Allow me at the outset to thank my dear colleague, Ambassador Valentin Rybakov for leading the uh, efforts of the group of friends and family and for organizing today's commemorative event. Excellencies, dear friends and colleagues, um, we meet in the midst of the severest, severest crisis of our time. The pandemic has impacted all aspects of human life and families as the primary unit of our societies are bearing the first and worst brunt. While some dependents, especially the elderly, suffered from inadequate health services and proper care, the children had to sacrifice their childhood in uncertainty and despair making them particularly vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. We've also seen a rise in domestic and gender-based violence, mental health issues, as well as other social ills, such as hate speech and xenophobia. The financial hardships due to loss of jobs and income added further stress in the well-being of the families. In Bangladesh, uh, families that are dependent on the income of expatriate migrant workers are severely affected as the migrant workers have to return in the midst of the pandemic. Women workers who constitute 80% of the labor force engaged in the ready-made garment sector have also been hard hit due to job loss, raising the risk to violence and abuse, also taking a toll on the hard-won uh, advancement and empowerment of society. It is at such times that we realize the role and importance of families in our lives, our first line of support. Excellencies, dear friends, the families recognized in the UDHR as a natural and fundamental group unit of society, which is entitled to protection by society and the state. As we build back better, our efforts must emphasize the role of the family because of its essential function as primary educator, economic driver, and provider of social safety net. In Bangladesh, we are committed to a whole of society approach in taking along all sections of its population towards sustainable and resilient COVID recovery. Welfare measures have been taken to support families in distress, which include cash and food grants for all vulnerable and marginal groups, including women and returning migrant workers. We have allocated over 16% of our total budget for social safety net programs targeting almost 11 million people. Building back better, dear colleagues, from the pandemic will depend on policies that promote the family and ensure inclusivity. Allow me to share some thoughts. First, the unique role of family, as well as the specific needs and vulnerabilities of its members, especially the older person and the younger members, should be a priority in COVID response and recovery efforts. Governments must ensure that the families suffering from hardships have access to adequate social protection measures. The coverage of such measures may be broadened to ensure that no one is left behind. Secondly, health services should be equitable and responsive to the social and psychological needs of all. Prioritization of vaccines for older people and other members with special needs must be ensured. Thirdly, children and youth who suffered from loss of education and income due to COVID should be offered with alternative options for continuation of education and means for self-reliance, including by bridging the digital divide. Finally, dear friends, the civil society academicians and the private sector must play the role in upholding the family by developing and implementing policies and programs targeted to families in an inclusive and participatory process. Excellencies, dear colleagues, as we grapple with the most challenging crisis of our time, the role of the family as the primary unit and the first call to provide support and unity cannot be emphasized more. We must promote the values and virtues of families and its pivotal role as we strive to build back better, stronger, and more resilient from this crisis. I thank you all. Ambassador Fatima, thank you so much for joining us. I apologize we skipped you earlier, uh, but we're delighted that, uh, that we were able to get you on. Um, uh, again, thank you. Um, and to continue with our uh, panel 
on, on the family. Our last speaker is uh, Haley McNamara, who's vice president and director of the International Center on Sexual Exploitation, also uh, uh, vice president uh, here in the United States of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, uh, a remarkably important organization. Uh, I remember very well uh, the, this organization used to uh, rent space from my organization way back in the day uh, after um, uh, Pat Truman took it over. It used to be called Morality and Media, and he changed the name and recalibrated it. Uh, and uh, Pat Truman and Don Hawkins have turned it into a powerhouse that actually is uh, in the process of playing a key role in uh, taking down uh, one of the most horrendous uh, families of uh, hardcore porn websites, Pornhub and, and the other tubes. Uh, so it is, uh, it is a special pleasure for me uh, to, uh, to bring on uh, Haley McNamara. Uh, Haley, you have the floor. Thank you so much for having me and for your kind words. Um, everyone at Nicosi says hello to you. Um, thank you everyone for uh, your attention today. You know, a few years ago, I sat down with three young girls. They were 14 and 15 years old. And by that young age, they had already experienced years of abuse in sex trafficking. They told me about how their abuse first started through direct messages on a social media platform. They shared how they had accounts that were set to private, but still, if an adult stranger messaged them, the message went through. And sometimes these sex traffickers would go to look at who one young girl was friends with on a platform. And they would use that friend or follower list to reach out to their entire network, almost like a menu, searching for someone vulnerable to groom. Sometimes these survivors explained that they would walk home from school and a trafficker would approach them, flirt with them, and ask for their social media information so they could follow them. And then the online grooming would begin from there. Very, very often, abusers would use the girls' posts to study them and know just how to present themselves, whether as a boyfriend or a confidant or as an escape. And in almost all of the cases of online grooming that led to sex trafficking, these girls shared that pornography was a significant factor. Often girls would be groomed and manipulated to share sexually explicit images of themselves with the trafficker who then used those images to either extort or blackmail them into offline abuse or to coerce them to continue to self-produce child sex abuse materials, sometimes called child pornography or CSAM for short, which they then sold to third parties. Online sex trafficking and grooming have become so rampant around the world in many ways because the online space has evolved prioritizing profits and not the safety of the young people that I met with. New tech startups are working to create spaces where people can connect and share and sadly, safety features are often not developed um, other than as an afterthought. Tragically, the online ecosystem has only attracted more sexual exploiters with the impact of COVID-19 as children began to spend more time online and parents were uh, either struggling with their jobs or with working while being at home and they just, there was just less supervision than usual. CSAM, again, child sexual abuse materials, has actually surged over 106% during COVID, according to the National Center on Missing and Exploited Children. Both on, this is an increase both on the dark web and on regular websites like social media sites. Children and adults alike faced increased vulnerability to sex trafficking during COVID, whether due to economic insecurities, disruption in education, or as I said, spending more time online. And research has shown that tragically, online grooming of children for sexual abuse can take as little as 20 minutes, according to researchers. Also, according to a recent Interpol assessment, there's been an increase in the sharing of, um, not only been an, in, an increase in the sharing of child sexual exploitation material or CSAM, but there's also been less reporting of that child abuse. 
And evidence also shows an unprecedented increase in internet use and consumption of online pornography during the pandemic, and possibly even directly caused by it. This of course includes increased risk of children being exposed to pornography. Again, children are spending more time online and parents often have an incomplete knowledge about the frequency of pornography exposure for children, its harms, and also recognizing that many of the filtering tools are complex and take too long to set up. And we know that children, childhood exposure to pornography is associated with a number of harms to their, uh, to, to, to their psychological and to their social development. So for example, pornography is linked to harms to brain development. Among adults, increased pornography use has been linked to decreased brain gray matter volume, decreased brain matter in the areas of the brain associated with motivation and decision-making. And current literature suggests that the adolescent brain may be more sensitive to pornography than the mature adult brain. Further, pornography normalizes sexual violence. Several studies have shown pornography consumption to be associated with both verbal and physical sexual aggression and actual and anticipated sexual violence among adolescents themselves. Pornography is also, of course, linked to negative attitudes towards the self and impact on mental health, including worse self-image, increased insecurity, um, and studies specifically on adolescent pornography use found lower life satisfaction, depressive symptoms, and even suicidal ideation among some. Now, the good news is that we can change these dynamics and we can instead incentivize safety first. One important policy reform that is, in, is increasing accountability for digital platforms for child sexual abuse and sex trafficking. Too often, laws have given big online platforms too much immunity from liability, and that's something that needs to change. In the US, we passed legislation in 2018, the FOSTA-SESTA Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, which made it so that online platforms are no longer immune from liability when they knowingly facilitate sex trafficking and prostitution. Before this, massive websites functioned as online slavery blocks operating in plain sight, free from any liability in the US, even when survivors filed lawsuits or contacted law enforcement. Now with this new law, there are some more tools for attorneys and law enforcement to better disrupt these platforms. And next, we're promoting the US bipartisan bill, the Earn It Act, which is seeking to revoke big tech's immunity from liability for child sexual abuse material. Further, the Earn It Act, if passed, would create a new federal commission. Uh, we know that technology changes so rapidly, it's difficult for decision makers to keep up in order to know what's needed. This commission would be multidisciplinary, uh, stacked with tech experts, but also child safety experts that would establish best business practices that are recommended to the technology community. Similar efforts have been pursued elsewhere as well. For example, the United Kingdom's Appropriate Age Design Code aims to help ensure that child privacy is protected online. And while this does not specifically address sex trafficking or sexual exploitation vulnerabilities, it so it is incomplete. Many of the, the suggestions of the UK appropriate age design code are very beneficial for protecting children in multiple ways. I truly believe that the establishment of best business practices are vital to not only disrupt online sex trafficking now, but to incentivize startup companies to start thinking about online safety from the very beginning. We can also help make a difference by raising awareness about the harms of pornography to children and pursuing policies that address that as well. For example, in the United States, 15 states have passed formal resolutions declaring pornography a hazard to public health. These resolutions led to international news coverage and helped educate countless people and laid the groundwork for future legislation. In Canada and in Colombia, there have been formal government hearings regarding the harm of the pornography industry. And in France and the Czech Republic, 
there have been law enforcement investigations into pornography companies that have participated in sex trafficking or sexual assaults. Another potential easy step is to pass laws to ensure that libraries, schools, and school given electronic devices are filtered to block pornography. This is common sense and is a great way to prevent children from being exposed to this content in a space that should be used for learning. There are also the larger, more comprehensive ideas of countrywide age verification, where a system verifies that someone is above 18 years old before being allowed to access pornography online, frequently using a visual ID method. Uh, and many countries already have similar systems for online gambling, for example. There are already different companies and entire industries, in fact, built around um, verifying age, and many companies are working on how to do this best uh, for pornography as well. And this idea is gaining traction internationally. Recently, the French parliament unanimously agreed to introduce a nat nationwide age verification system. And I know advocates in Poland, South Africa, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and more are looking to follow suit. The problem of child sexual abuse and pornography amid COVID is vast, and there's no single silver bullet, no one solution that fixes everything, but each step forward creates a rippling effect, educating the facts, protecting families, and setting the stage for even more progress. The, younger, the young survivors that I met with who were trafficked on social media eventually had their voices heard. This company, the social media company heard their story and now no longer lets adults direct message minors that they don't, that they don't know. And that's continuing to impact millions and maybe even billions of youth for the better around the world. So I call on you all to take that first step, whether that's raising awareness about these dangers, advocating for policies, or even simply having a conversation with your own child. Thank you. Uh, Haley, uh, that was a really terrific presentation. Uh, thank you so much. You guys are doing such amazing work. You know, uh, in in doing the research for 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 my latest book, um, I, I discovered things I didn't even know. For instance, I'd never heard of the name Mind Geek, hmm. and I would bet dollars to donuts that nobody you know who that is. No, nobody you know listening in today knows that Mind Geek and its family of companies uh, invented streaming pornography. Uh, inspired by YouTube, and that their family of companies, uh, uh, websites, which I don't want to name, uh, 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 now have more traffic than uh, Facebook and Amazon. I mean, it is profound. Um, you know, exposing children to this is a real problem, but but uh, also uh, the, the terrible degradation of uh, consumers, um, adult consumers, is, is, is quite profound. So um, hats off to you guys. You're doing exceptional work. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud to know Thank you guys. You. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Now, uh, so th that is the end of, of our panel. I, I want to thank Dr. Sharifa al uh Mark Regnerus, uh, Dr. Michella, and, and Haley. Uh, we're not going to take questions. We had to shut down chat um, because uh, we were taken over by people who do not like what we're doing. And that's a, not such a bad thing, you know? Uh, uh, to make the right people angry. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to go into civil society statements. Um, we have, uh, you know, a, a dozen civil society statements. They're going to be brief. Uh, they, they each have assured us that they're going to be, you know, no more than three minutes. So yeah, we're going to go directly to civil society statements. It is one of the remarkable things about the UN pro-life and pro-family movement is that everybody around the world is involved. You know, at the original Cairo conference, uh, several hundred regular people uh, heard that this was going on and uh, went and raised their own money and went to uh, Cairo, uh, Ambassador Idris. Uh, they went to Cairo for the for the Cairo conference, not, not having known any UN diplomat or ever seen a UN document. And uh, they assisted uh, many delegations there in blocking an international right to abortion and redefinition of the family and much else. So, so NGOs have been an integral part of the UN debate on life and family for a quarter of a century, but NGOs are a part of the DNA of the United Nations. NGOs have been participating 
in, in the UN uh, at it from, from its founding onward, uh, including the negotiation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, uh, so uh, civil society is here uh, and civil society is going to speak to you today. And we're going to begin with the vice chairman of the Africa Christian Professionals Forum, who is also the chairman of the Kenyan Christian Professional Forum, uh, Charles Kenjama. And uh, Charles, uh, please, the microphone is yours. You are welcome. Thank you, uh, and uh, I'm happy to be here uh, to join this fantastic uh, session uh, to commemorate the International Day of Families. I will speak briefly, and hopefully I will keep within three or four minutes. A Kenya Christian Professionals Forum was set up in 2010. We are a faith-based organization that uh, is a part of civil society. We are a professional organization. We bring together uh, Christians from different uh, church backgrounds, Catholics, uh, Protestants, Evangelicals, uh, professionals of different uh, backgrounds. And our agenda is to support uh, matters of life, uh, family, uh, religion, and good governance. And for the last 11 years in Kenya, and then for the last one year uh, with our sister organization in Africa, we have focused on promoting uh, the family as a fundamental unit of society. Some of the useful experiences we've had is working together with the government uh, of Kenya, our Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, in coming up with a family protection and promotion policy that uh, policy has been finalized. It is before the cabinet of Kenya for adoption. And, and we feel that this is an approach that can be adopted in other countries that can help mainstream uh, the agenda of family promotion and protection in the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. We've been involved in court cases where we've tried to uh, support and promote the right values uh, for the family strengthening of marriages, understanding of the natural family, and so on. And we have also been engaged in interventions with our local parliament in trying to ensure that lawmaking is sensitive to uh, what are the needs of the family. Uh, recently, we've started a few programs that we think will help to develop and entrench an evidence-based approach to advocacy. Uh, one of them is uh, we have launched uh, preparation of what will be an annual state of the family report. This state of the family report will be developed together with our partners who are the umbrella church organizations in Kenya. And we are going to scan the state of the family um, in different aspects, including the law, uh, the culture, and so on. And, and we hope that this report will guide a government intervention. We call upon uh, those who are participating from other countries uh, to work with us so that we can develop a, a mechanism in which we have a state of family reports in different countries, in different continents. And this can be the benchmark for intervention, policy intervention uh, going forward. We are also setting up a family and faith resources center where we are trying to bring together counselors persons who are experts in uh, family counseling, in, in uh, family education and training, as well as resources, books, and so on that can help families uh, to um, deal with the challenges that we face in modern society. And lastly, I could mention we set up a virtual call center. This is meant to assist in counseling. Uh, women and girls who are facing crisis pregnancies, uh, couples who are facing crisis in their families. And these are some of the initiatives that we think uh, would be very useful in the post-COVID era as we move on uh, to the next uh, five, 10 years. Thank you. Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are going to let somebody jump the line here. Uh, Luis uh, Belchior, uh, who's the co-founder co of Empowered Youth Coalition, uh, has to get to work. Um, so uh, we are also pro-work. So uh, Luis, uh, you have three minutes. Hi, I'm Luis Bilshaw representing the Empowered Youth Coalition. We're honored to give a statement at this important event celebrating the International Day of Families. 
The fact that 25 UN member states have stepped up to form a UN coalition of governments called the Group of Friends of the Family, and the fact that these 25 states have made a commitment to stand up for the family in the UN negotiation, this sends a very important message to youth worldwide. The Empowered Youth Coalition thanks each and every member nation of the group of the Friends of the Family. What is the Empowered Youth Coalition? We won't be offended if you haven't heard of us. The Empowered Youth Coalition, also known as the EYC, was founded on May 15th in the year 2021 on the International Day of Families. Yes, <laughs> just two days ago, we launched the EYC and our new website at theempoweredyouthcoalition.org. We launched Saturday with 196 member organizations. We feel it nothing short of the miracle that EYC attracted so many organizations global during just a three-week membership drive. Our goal was 100, and we thought that would be tough. But now we have over 200 organizations with more joining daily. What has attracted so many to our previously unknown organization? I believe it's because of our mission and our approach. The mission of EYC is to unite youth and young adults across the globe to stand for life and family. Youth everywhere are thirsting for clear, good old family values to guide them through an increasingly confusing world. It's not easy for millennials or Gen X to navigate through our highly sexualized, political correct world culture, a culture that demands tolerance and promotes standing for nothing, a cancel culture that shuts you down if you try to stand for anything. UN diplomats know better than anyone how hard it can be to stand for life and family. Even just the word family incite all night battles in UN negotiation. As an intern for the Mozambique UN mission, I witnessed closed negotiation and I saw exactly what your countries are up against. So now, what is EYC's approach? Well, we focus on youth and young adult age 15 to 35. The EYC welcomes people of all ages. You might say we take a family-based approach to youth advocacy. About half of our member organization are youth organization and the other half are mentoring organization with lots of wisdom and experience to share. In fact, the EYC was co-founded by a mother and a daughter who realized the need for generation to work together to protect life and family. Finally, I conclude expressing once again our deep gratitude to government sponsoring this event. And we invite all who are listening to join us in our mission of empowering the next generation by going to empoweredyouthcoalition.org. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, uh, and welcome to the coalition. Uh, next up, we have an old friend of ours from the Transatlantic Christian Coalition in the Netherlands, Henk Schothorst. Henk, the floor is yours and welcome. I am Henk Jambos from the Netherlands. Um, a country uh, which has not a very good name uh, in family policies, but there are a lot of uh, good families here, and uh, we try to be one of them. I'm very thankful to be in your midst and uh, want to say something about our organization. Transatlantic Christian Council is a Dutch-based non-profit organization. It develops an international network of Christians involved in public policy and influences policy from a Christian perspective. For permanent monitoring and control, TCC speaks up at international organizations such as the UN, the EU, the OSCE to stand up for a Christian voice and to make a difference. The European Union, I worked in the European Parliament for seven years in the Foreign Affairs Committee, where I learned how urgent it was to do something about the family. Um, the position uh, TCC takes is possible because TCC is now officially accredited and as an authorized consultative organization at UN, EU and other organizations. Because we work with worldwide member states and uh, are now sta also starting at the African Union, we are moving towards a more international name, the Christian Council International, as our American branch is already called. The main focus themes are life, family, and freedom, such as freedom of religion 
and freedom of education. And something about uh, where we think we stay as friends of the family in contrast to our opponents. We as a united family, uh, a people and family friends, we assume a worldview in which a human being on the one hand has inviolable dignity with an equal claim to fundamental rights for everyone. On the other hand, there is the recognition that man is imperfect and prone to evil and abuse of power. This inconvenient truth is also the reason for the introduction of checks and balances through the separation of powers, the executive, legislative, and judiciary. As a people split into identity groups, our opponents seem to reject a change or redefine these core truths in such a way that each group and each individual has the right to decide for himself what is this truth. And these claimed or experienced truths must then be accepted by everyone. Those who do not go along with this identity politics leading to political correctness are dismissed as xenophobic, racist, homophobic, etc. Thus, under the cover of inclusivity, diversity, and social justice, unfreedom is imposed for all. A cancel culture of the deemed wrong past in which the whole system must be dismantled and reformed and supposed white domination must come to an end. However, the problem is not in the system, but in the human being. And denial of this truth is the core source of all the problems. And um, I just uh, finished with a picture here. This is my family. I come from a family of 10. My wife comes from a family of 12. So being here as an advocate for the family is because I've seen the value of a family. And myself, we have a family of six. And we are very thankful for it. And we are trying to um advocate for the family in the world thank you very much <laughs> hank i would say that demographically you're doing your job congratulations thank you and and thank you for uh being with us today uh next we are going to move to sarah buckland of jamaica um who is uh the founder of chosen to glow ministries and also the youth ambassador for love march uh, Sarah was giving me good advice on chat uh, earlier in the conference on what to do with the uh, with the interlopers. Uh, so, Sarah, thank you for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Roos. I really appreciate. I'd like to extend sincere gratitude to you and Miss Corenti and all from CFAM and everyone here for extending this kind in invitation to Chosen to Global Ministries, Jamaica to make a statement on this very important event commemorating the International Day of Families. Family is of great importance personally, as I can attest as a young Christian professional, that I owe my identity and values to the nurturing of my parents, which still impacts my life today. Our organization works in Christian education, literature, research and outreach, both in person and via social media to promote pro-family and pro-life policies. A wise man once said, it is your own face that you see reflected in the water, and it is your own self that you see in your heart. Proverbs 27, verse 19. As the old adage goes, what we sow, we reap. The world we live in is the sum result of the choices we make, what we choose to value, and who we choose to invest in. Like a seed full of potential, the blossoming of a healthy society depends on how well we water the units of individual families. From the genesis of time, it has been a commonly accepted fact that the family unit is the primary and perhaps the most fundamental agent of socialization. Marriage and the family serve tremendous religious and cultural importance in the Judeo-Christian tradition as divinely appointed institutions for imparting values with a, with a personal touch, a role that no other institution, government, school, or even village can sufficiently replace. 
On this premise, on behalf of Chosen to Grow Ministries, I present her today to share briefly with you the Jamaican experience of how the family can make or break societal outcomes with some primary and reanalysis data I performed as a social science researcher leading towards my PhD program. The tremendous positive impacts of parental involvement was a major finding from data reanalysis I performed targeting over 3,000 Jamaican high school students. Children from families with high parental involvement, including having a set curfew for their child, knowing their child's friendships and their whereabouts outside of school hours, were 220% less likely to skip school. 160% less likely to have behavioral problems and significantly more likely to have better academic performance. In particular, the likelihood of parental involvement was found to increase by 160% among students whose parents were married compared with those with unmarried parents. In another of my primary studies, children living with married parents displayed vastly better emotional health than those from other structures in that they expressed a sense of security having high self-esteem and getting more appreciation these findings highlight that the marital union was the most conducive environment to meet all levels on maslow's hierarchy of needs physiological safety needs belongingness love among the student respondents just by following the pattern suggested in Genesis 2 verse 24. When this unit becomes broken, the floodgates of delinquency burst open. For instance, a prison survey by the Jamaica Constabulary Force in 2012 found that 66% of prison inmates came from family backgrounds other than nuclear. These empirical examples re-emphasize that the family is indeed the central cradle and pillar for a healthy spiritual, physical, and moral development of the next generation. I therefore stand with you today. I therefore stand with you today to emphasize the importance of policies upholding the cohesive natural family as they serve as potent protective factors against societal dysfunction, especially critical in the context of increasing depression and suicide in this pandemic. Given this empirical data, parental rights for monitoring and involvement with their child should therefore be promoted as policy priorities. Incentives should be given for faithful monogamous heterosexual unions as it is in this environment that families truly thrive. As we strive to heal from the COVID pandemic, a key to truly sustainable societies comes when we promote abstinence until marriage, faithfulness and commitment rather than short-term emotional gratification. If we do, we literally can collectively restore the world for the better. So in conclusion, as we reflect on our own faces, the choices that lie beyond us is ours to make. We are at a crossroads. I challenge us that the path to true progress lies in promoting family-friendly policies. So on behalf of Chosen to Glow Ministries Jamaica and as a friend of the Geneva Consensus Declaration, we unashamedly and unreservedly reaffirm the value of protecting healthy families. Let us endeavor to preserve the treasure of the natural family to achieve a healthier, more stable society. And I hope that we all here at the United Nations will reaffirm these values as well. Thank you so much. Sarah, thank you. Uh, one of the things I like best about your talk is uh, that you cited scripture. You know, one, one, of the, one of the things that I admire most about our, our Muslim brothers and sisters at the United Nations is that they are fearless in citing uh, the Quran. And I think that Christians uh, should be just as fearless as you were today in citing scripture. And we are proud to stand with you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we are going to hear from our good friends in Poland um, who are doing amazing work in standing up for, for life, faith, and family. Uh, I welcome Karolina Pawlowska, who is the director of Ordo Juris International Law Center, uh, whom we work with very closely uh, throughout the year. Um, the floor is yours. Dear Austin, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation to this very important and powerful event. Uh, let me just briefly uh, describe uh, what am I doing, what is the Ordo Juris. Um, as you've mentioned, my name is Karina Pawłowska. I'm the director of the Ordo Juris International Law Center. And uh, the Ordo Juris is a legal think tank based in Poland, uh, dedicated to defending fundamental human rights, especially to defend family at every level. 
family, uh, as you've all mentioned here many times, which is so important, is at the center of our society. There is no well-being of the society without the well-being of the family. The family, if it's healthy, is the best envir environment for development of each person. And it is proved that, proof that the well-functioning family prevents from addictions, psychological problems and violence. I believe that uh, the COVID pandemic shows us like never before that we have to remember about the simple truth. We have to remember about the simple truth that was enshrined in so many international treaties beginning from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is present in so many constitutions of uh, so many uh, worldwide countries. After all, what we have to remember that family uh, is something that we can count on in these difficult times that uh, sometimes we have to challenge. And what I would like also to point out uh, that uh, we believe that the COVID can be also a, some kind of a chance for us, a chance for a shift that it so much needed in global policy to put the family at the center of social policies. We can observe that there is more and more positive tendencies in this area and I would like to especially mention here Hungary, our great neighbor and uh, which has so many great achievements with the family uh, policy or my country, Poland, that just have recently introduced complex program aiming at strengthening the family. Uh, our institute, the Ordo Iuris Institute of Legal Culture also has a long tradition of advocating for the family in Poland and also at the international level. We have issued really comprehensive reports on best practices in family policies in Europe, advocating especially for allowing parents to decide about the best model of childcare of their young children. Because unlike in many other countries, Poland and uh, countries of Eastern and Central Europe are often victims of uh, mm, old thinking that the best way to help parent, the best way to help family is to uh, provide them only one type of child care, institutional child care, which uh, we believe uh, is the reason why so uh, there is so uh, uh, low number of people in Poland and countries like ours that want to have children. Uh, we have also prepared and promoted the draft of local family charter, a declaration that is adopted by more than 50 Polish municipalities that is highlighting the importance of family in local policy. And I believe uh, best proof of its importance is the immense attack that was targeted at our institute and municipalities that adopted it. Uh, which was uh, even present not only in media, but also even at the European Parliament in resolutions of some uh, European uh, members of European parliaments. The scale of fake news and manipulations concerning this simple document, this simple declaration that was just uh, highlighting uh, this general guarantees that was already present in international treaties and Polish constitutions was really unprecedented. Uh, very important initiative that uh, we are committed to uh, from 2018 is the project of the Convention of the Rights of the Family that was co-written by us and organizations from whole of the Europe. This project is a proposition of a positive alternative that helps uh, the family to be stronger and defend the institution of the family from threats that are posed by the modern world. Carolina, the aim is also I, regret, to... I regret to let you know that you're more than a minute over time. Can, can you... Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought that I was... Uh, I was quick. Sorry for that. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the end. I'm, uh, I just wanted to point out that um, um, 
the aim of this project is also to combat and prevent domestic violence and to be a, a positive alternative to the Istanbul Convention. So getting to the end, I would be very happy to share with you this project because I believe that this kind of initiative could really make a difference in the international discourse. And I would really like to one more time express my gratitude to all absolutely great things that you are doing, you, the group of family, friends, and I wish you all great evening and I'm looking forward for our future cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for being uh, be, uh, speaking too long. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the good work that, that you do. Um, I, I, I just wish that you could do something with the Polish delegation to the UN. Um, yes. Uh, you know, I know that they're all caught up in the EU consensus. So I, I understand that there's a reason. Uh, next, we are going to go to uh, an old, old friend. Ignacio Orswaga, who is the uh, chairman of an organization whose name I have never been able to pronounce, and I will stumble over it now, uh, Hasteor, and Hasteor does remarkable work in Spain and around the world, and uh, Ignacio, are you there? I want to turn the floor over to you for three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh... Austin, uh, CFAM, Family Watch for inviting us to hear. In Spain, we say, hazte oír. Uh, and, and since then, go to present our statement today. Um, 74 years ago, the UN declared the family as the natural and fundamental unit of society, as several uh, speakers today have um, uh, reminded us. Uh, but the natural family, based uh, in the stable union of one man and one woman, is not only the fundamental unit of society, it's also the main mechanisms our uh, societies have to renew themselves. It's also the ideal place where children acquire the virtues and learn the values necessary for our societies to prosper. Uh, and also is the source of stability and happiness for the majority of the people all over the world. That's, you know, different polls uh, state uh, year after year. As it was mentioned by uh, today by Professor Moskela, um, we have been able to see how the family has been especially important in these difficult times of confinement and all types of restrictions throughout the world. But today, uh, we also know that some forces, both in the private and the public sphere, nationally and globally try to blur the definition of the family or even attack the natural family itself. That's why your work in favor of the family as members of the group of friends of the family, uh, both nationally in your own countries, but also at the UN level is so important. And that's why also millions of families all over the world must organize in an effective way to defend our own rights from those that want to take them away from us. At uh, Aftoir and also um, Citizen Go Foundation, we try to help families and, and people, uh, you know, that share family values all over the world to organize and to participate so our voices are heard by those in power. Now that's what Aftoir means, you know, make yourself heard or speak out. So, I uh, just wanted to thank uh, you all for defending and promoting the family. Thank you. Ignacio, I have known you for many, many years and you're a brave fighter in, uh, in this work and uh, we're very proud to stand with you and thank you for joining us today. So we will move to um, Alexis Fragosa. Uh, Alexis is a new employee here at CFAM. She's the director of uh, government relations and also is running the International Youth Coalition for us, which is uh, now 10 years old and has 50,000 members. And she is going to read the statement of, of uh, Civil Society for the Family, which is a coalition of more than 200 organizations around the world who stand together at the United Nations uh, on behalf of life and family. So we will turn it over to Alexis. Alexis, you have the floor. Thank you, Austin. I wanted to start by citing Pope Francis. Last week, he spoke to an Italian forum on the importance of the protection of the family. The event highlighted the demographic crisis brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic and the strong bias against the family and consumerist societies. He said, and I quote, 
How is it possible that a woman should feel ashamed for the most beautiful gift that life can offer? It's society that should feel ashamed. A society that does not welcome life stops living. Truly, as we have heard today already, and as we will continue to hear, the COVID-19 pandemic has exaggerated the already existing social problems families experience across the world. Certainly, resilient and cohesive families have fared better during the pandemic by all accounts. But while some families emerged from the pandemic stronger, those of us who have been deprived of the social protection of the family have suffered economically, mentally, and health-wise. Therefore, we can comfortably predict that it will be the family that will rebuild and regenerate society after this pandemic. Governments should do everything in their power to strengthen and protect the family because the very life of society depends on it. This isn't just smart policy. This is a human rights imperative. International human rights laws define the family as the natural and fundamental group unit of society and stress that the family is entitled to protection by society and the state. Many of you have seen the imposing mural in the UN Security Council chamber that depicts a phoenix rising from the chaos below with the family at the center of the rebirth of humanity. The family and the phoenix are depicted as one at the heart of rebuilding the world after the Second World War illustrating the importance of the family to the entire human rights edifice. The artist of the mural saw the family at the heart of a multilateral restoration project. Today, once again, just like in 1945, it will be the family, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, who will rebuild society from within. I thank all the member states and organizations who are here with us at this event because you recognize the importance of the family as a cornerstone of our society and the essential component to a successful post-pandemic rebuild. Let us all pray and work to make sure that governments recognize this and put in place the policies necessary to strengthen and protect the families so that we can indeed build a society that welcomes life, one that is not ashamed of the family, but celebrates the family and treasures it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful UN debut. Uh, and we're delighted to have you on staff. Uh, and thank you for that. Next up then is uh, ADF International. Um, Alliance Defending Freedom has been one of the most important organizations in our country and around the world in def defending life, faith, and family. Uh, they have brought many, many lawsuits and, and successful ones uh, on behalf of uh, people who are besieged by the wider culture or elites or whatever at, on college campuses and, and elsewhere. It is phenomenal what they have done. Uh, many years ago, they got involved in, in, in UN uh, negotiations um, and founded AD, ADF International, and we have stood with them since that time. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ralph Rodriguez, uh, legal counsel of ADF International. Ralph, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Austin. Thank you, CFAM, um, Family Watch International, and the group of Friends of the Family for uh, being on this very important call commemorating the International Day of the Family. And thank you again, Austin, for that introduction to ADF and ADF International. And we are a faith-based legal adv advocacy organization that protects fundamental freedoms and promotes the inherent dignity of all people. As such, we enthusiastically welcome every opportunity to elevate the family's prominence in society, because when the family flourishes, so does freedom. International law unambiguously outlines the obligations of states to protect the most fundamental group unit of society. States parties to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights recognize that the widest possible protection and assistance should be accorded to the family, which is the, national, which is the natural and fundamental group unit of society, particularly for its establishment and while it is responsible for the care and education of dependent children. 
and that's citing Article 10.1 of that covenant. To that end, ADF International is committed to ensuring states fulfill this legal duty by promoting laws and policies that enable a family to prosper uninhibited. It is greatly encouraging to see states go above and beyond the call of duty and firmly commit themselves to truly being friends of the family. A friend is most valuable in times of crisis. And so yes, we do regret the growing crisis of concerted efforts to delegitimize the family's essential role in society by undermining what the law says about matters such as the sanctity of life and the primacy of parental rights, for example. However, two truths that the COVID-19 pandemic have illuminated for everyone on all sides of the ideological spectrum are that life is sacred and that the home is most often the place where we are safest. As society begins to reopen and confronts the many challenges that will come along with that, governments will do well to afford the family great deference and utmost protection. The family depends on the protections and freedoms that the government provides. Conversely, governments depend on the family to grow and nurture the next generation of citizens and leaders to keep us moving toward liberty and prosperity. I thank you all and uh, I look forward to hearing everyone else's statements. Ralph, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, my wife and I were proud for many years to be on the faculty of the Blackstone Legal Fellowship and just took delightful, spent delightful time with ADF folks out in, out in uh, Scottsdale. So uh, thank you uh, for your comments. Annie Franklin, who's the spokesperson today for the UN Family Rights Caucus, uh, which is a creation of uh, a Family Watch International now many, many years ago. Um, Annie and Sharon have been involved in this work for a long time and have been central players in all that we have been able to achieve over these years. Annie Franklin of the Family Rights Caucus. Your Excellencies, distinguished panelists, dear colleagues, it's an honor and a privilege for me to deliver these statements on behalf of the UN Family Rights Caucus. We are grateful to those who envisioned, planned, and sponsored this event. We are especially grateful to the governments representing the Group of Friends of the Family, a formidable bloc of countries dedicated to ensuring that the institution of the family is not taken for granted, is not overlooked, is not ignored, but rather is recognized, supported, promoted, protected, and given its due place within the UN agenda. One of the most basic human rights recognized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the right to found a family. In the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the right of children to grow up in a family environment and to know and be cared for by their parents is specifically recognized. These rights can only be realized if the family is protected. To protect the ability of the institution of the family to exist and to flourish is to protect one of the most basic human rights known to mankind. The UN Family Rights Caucus was founded to work at ensuring that the family is protected at the United Nations with the protection of parental rights and the health and innocence of children more specifically in mind. The COVID-19, yes, has indeed exposed even more urgently than before the need for legal and social protection of the family and the need of family-oriented policies. Family stability is a critical component of social stability and social protection. For it is in a stable family providing an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding that children and youth learn healthy attitudes toward women and girls, the prevention of disease, food production and preparation, sanitation, income generating skill and sustainable treatment of our environment. Governments have an obligation under international law to adopt laws and best policies that provide condition conducive to family formation and stability. When the family breaks down, the consequences for men, women, and especially children are far reaching with repercussions throughout society. May I remind you of the perhaps prescient series of protection of the family resolution adopted at the Human Rights Council, reaffirming that the family plays a critical role in eradicating poverty and hunger, achieving universal primary education, promoting gender equality and empowering women, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, combating HIV and AIDS, malaria and other diseases. 
The role of the family in supporting its members with disabilities was specifically highlighted in the 2016 HRC resolution. And the 2017 resolution on the family emphasized the way the family supports elderly persons. In addition, in 2018, a cross-regional joint statement of member state commented on the profound interrelatedness between the interest and the needs of the individual and the family. We humbly suggest that these important texts be remembered in the current and post-COVID work of protecting the family. We encourage member states to build on the natural, extraordinary strength of stable families. Characterized by a strong, committed marital relationship centered upon transmitting appropriate ethical, cultural, and religious values to children in an atmosphere that emphasized the interconnectedness, the complementarity, and responsibility of family members toward each other, members of the extended family and the community. Such a family produces capable and well-socialized women, men, and children. Even in situation of direst poverty, the single most important factor influencing social outcome for individuals is whether they are a member of a strong, stable family. Children thriving in poor communities are statistically more life likely to live in family characterized by traditional family fireside values, devoted mothers and fathers, happy marriages, and warm cooperative bonds with siblings, grandparents, other relations, and the broader community. As we commemorate the International Year of the Family and we look ahead to the post-COVID world, it is becoming, it is befitting us to remember that stable family are the glue that hold societies together in the best and in the worst of times. I thank you. We thank you for your uh, excellent intervention. Um, it is my pleasure to, uh, to introduce our, our final civil society um, speaker, one of my favorite people, uh, working with one of our most important institutions, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Grace Melton, who covers the United Nations for Heritage. Grace, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Austin. And thank you to the group of Friends of the Family and to CFAM and Family Watch for convening this wonderful event today. My name is Grace Melton, and I am pleased to deliver this statement on behalf of the Heritage Foundation. We are an ECOSOC accredited NGO whose mission is to formulate and promote conservative public policies based on the principles of free enterprise, limited government, individual freedom, and traditional American values. As the United Nations has recognized in countless instances, the family is the natural and fundamental unit of society and the bedrock of civil society. Strong families make strong communities and strong nations. Therefore, governments and UN entities alike should respect the agency of families to enjoy freedom and opportunity and to work for prosperity. Each member of the family, every man, woman, and child from conception is endowed by his creator with inherent human dignity. The right to life is our most basic human freedom and every human being should be welcomed in life and protected in law. The natural family springs from the marriage of one man and one woman. Mothers and fathers each have unique parenting roles that should, not, that should be acknowledged and not diminished. They are not interchangeable and children deserve both a mother and a father. Men and women are equal in dignity and worth, but they are not the same. Biological sex is binary and self-declared gender identity cannot change biological reality. A false equivalency of the sexes erases equality for women and causes harm to children. Parents have the primary responsibility for the upbringing and education of their children. Governments and international law should respect parents' right to direct their children's education, care, and upbringing. Strong families are the best resource every society has for caring for and raising children into healthy and responsible adults, lessening the need for dependence upon government aid. Around the world, the family faces many threats and it is deserving of protection by governments. Laws and policies must protect the innate human dignity of the individual and the essential value of community. By safeguarding and harnessing the many social benefits that the family bestows, we will facilitate achievement of sustainable development goals and leave a better world to our children. Thank you. Grace, thank you so much. Um, this is um, well, the very end of what I think has been a very enlightening 
uh, conference uh, recognizing the International Day of the Family, um, an important annual event at the United Nations. It is left to me to thank all of you uh, speakers and participants uh, for joining us today. I especially want to help uh, thank the, uh, uh, the uh, group of friends of the family, uh, the 25 member states of the United Nations who stand together for the family, most especially our friends at, at Belarus. I want to thank all of the UN member states who spoke today. I see that uh, Ambassador Idris is still with us today. Uh, you stayed to the very end. God bless you. I see our friends from Saudi Arabia are still here. I suspect many others are here. I see Uganda here and Turkmenistan and many others. And thank you all for being here. I also want to thank our friends at Civil Society for the Family, uh, Family Rights Caucus, Family Watch International. Uh, I want to especially thank our speakers from the Academy, uh, Dr. Sharif El Amadi, Mark Regnerus, and Melissa Michella, and uh, and lastly um, Haley uh, McNamara, um, who whose uh, comments on on pornography were were profound. Um, I, I I thank you all. Uh, this, uh, uh, this broadcast will be up, uh, I think, on the UN website. It probably is there now. Um, and uh, I hope to see all of you soon. And so thank you all. God bless.